All right, well, I'm excited to be at Trailhead this morning. It's been, we, we figured it out. In my 14 years of ministry, I have never preached on a, uh, on a 31st of December. I was a youth pastor in 2006, and that's when the last one was. And I, I told everyone this morning that I was, I was doing a lock-in, so I didn't actually preach on the 31st. I preached on the 1st of January. It was 2 o'clock in the morning or something, I'm sure. But, uh, but it's fun to, to wrap up the year on uh, on the, uh, at church and to preach about something that really has depth and meaning. And, and so we wanted to talk about trusting in God and, and, and learning to trust in God and, and understanding uh, the purpose of it. I, I think too often we, we, uh, we, you know, we put on the world's view of things at times and it's easy to do. Uh, we are inundated with media and in the news outlets and all these different things and we get caught up in stuff and uh, we get caught up in the love of money we get caught up in the love of things, especially coming out of Christmas. I know some of us are like, thank God it's Christmas is over or whatever. I don't know your view on it. Some of you are like, no, I love Christmas. Bring it back. Um, but I, I think that for us as a church, we need to start on a, on a solid foundation. So in praying, I thought, well, let's talk about trust this morning. Let's talk about what, uh, what God has for us in 2018. And, and I, I don't believe that we could be successful going forward without trusting God. And, and that's really the foundation and the, and the root of salvation is trusting in God. Now, I know you may look around, and I, we talked about this this morning. You look around, and you say, well, there's a lot of empty seats this morning. And... Um, now, don't be pointing, judging and saying, well, all those people, they, just, they love sleep and, uh, or they hate the cold weather or whatever. And we can get fixated on numbers. And one thing that I, I told myself a long time ago is we can't get fixated on numbers. It's in, and uh, I know David Bowles and myself and Van, we were talking about this morning, is we talk about quality and, and, and who we are. And it's not numbers. And a lot of times we get caught up in the hype of, oh, because, you know, last week this place was packed out. Well, that was two services packed into one. And, and it was also Christmas Eve where people want to feel more spiritual. So it, that's what happens. But um, for us that are in this room, I want you to shake any distractions out right now. I want you to stop thinking about work on Tuesday. I think some of you may have to work tomorrow. I know some of the school teachers in this room are dreading. I already talked to a few. They don't want to think about Wednesday. Um, but some of you guys in this room, you, you think, now you're thinking about debt. You're thinking about debt because of, of all the Christmas stuff you spent. And you think, oh, I wish I went about that extra present because of the re expectation in, in their face when they were like, oh, thanks. And they kind of threw it off the side and you're like, you have no idea how much that cost, All right? My one kid, I got him a, got him a new two, a 2DS and he hasn't played with it for like but 15 minutes. He's playing with his, his old tablet from three years ago. And I'm like, oh, why did I spend that money, right? But it happens, you, you know. So I think a lot of these things are distractions. So everyone take a deep breath, let it out. You're here. You're here for the next 35 minutes to 45 minutes. Just sit tight. We're going to talk about trust, okay? It's important. It's very important. So in the midst of difficulty, we've got to learn to trust in God because his plans are good and his grace is abundant to those who look to him alone as their help. So when, um, when you're fighting battles, are you trusting or are you doubting? Ask yourself this. Or do you trust God? Is, your, is the words coming out of your mouth, are they trust? Are they faith? Are they words of doubt and unbelief? Are they words of destruction? Are they words that, that cause you to, to fear more than give you faith and understanding that God is in control? What are you speaking out? For the out of the abundance of the heart, right? That's the mouth speaketh. So asking yourself these questions, what is coming out of your mouth? Do you have trust in your heart? Are you trusting him? In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says, And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. He has given us a great and, and great and precious promises. Do you hold on to these promises? Do you know these promises that are, spe are spoken of in the word of God? Do you know them? The promises of Abraham, the promises to Moses, the covenants, the, the, the Noah covenant, the Abraham covenant. Do you know these covenants? Well, all of these covenants belong to you as well. 
in those moments that it looks dark and dim and, and, and maybe just a little bit more difficult than normal, I mean, you've got promises. You've got promises. But one thing we've got to shake down this morning, and I think it's important that we do it, it's imperative that we do this, is, is that you get a hold of a, a true revelation of theology and not some theology that you grew up with. And that theology is, is that God puts you through trials and temptations. God does not put you through trials and temptations. He doesn't tempt you with sin. In James chapter four, it debunks this, okay? So stop walking around with this, uh, this theology, ideology of, of this idea, okay? It's really sad that you think, well, God just put me through this storm. Find some Bible-based scripture on that for me, please, because it's not true. Sometimes you start thinking this. You think, well, it's just, it's just the way it is. You think because you're sick, that God's slowing you down for a reason. No, mm -mm, no, that's not, that's, not, that's not in the Bible, okay? This idea of sickness. You think, oh, I got the flu because God wanted me to slow down. That's not true. And that sickness and disease is of the enemy, it's of the devil. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and God's come to give us what? Life. Jesus came to give us life, life in abundance. Well, I gotta tell you right now, if, if I feel like I'm dead if I have the flu, all right, when I can't breathe out of my nose, right, I don't get enough sleep at night, I'm sitting there, I'm restless, God, God wants me to what? Rest in him. God doesn't want me to toss and turn all night long and, 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 and have sickness and disease for some reason. God doesn't, God doesn't tempt me with a, a or, or, or test me um, with a low bank account. That's just bad stewardship. Some of you think, oh, I gotta learn how to eat beans out of a can. God's putting me through this. No, you just need to be better with your money, right? We, we start putting all these, these crazy theologies on God and say, well, God's doing all these things against me. No, God's saying that when these things come against you, come to me. That's what he's saying. That's what he said, it, it, the burden, cast these burdens to me, I'll take these burdens. I, I wanna help you. I wanna show you the right way of doing things. That, that's, that's the way God operates. God doesn't operate in the way of like, yeah, I put all that on you. Yeah, I wanted to see if you could handle it. <laughs> no, God's not a mean God. That's the problem with this world. We got Christians running around being like, you know, that's just God. No, that's just stupidity. That's just people not walking with God. That's people saying, don't worry, God. I know you did this to me. I'll take care of it. I will walk through it. God actually never wants you to do anything. God wants you to accept his grace, his righteousness, his goodness, his love. That's what God wants. God wants you to accept these things so that when you're going through the trials and tribulations that you can pass through it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 Matthew chapter, 27, or Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, is the scriptures of the parable of the man who, who builds his house on the sand. And the storms and the trials and the tribulations come, and because he's built it on the sand, not a firm foundation, then his, his house washes away. Well, the man who builds his house on a rock, on Jesus, then what happens when the storms and the trials come, it doesn't go away. The, the house stands, stands to be true. It's the, same, it's the same storm. It's the same, it's the same trials, same tribulation, all these different things that happen, but it's where do you put your trust? Do you put it on him? And when you do that, then when those storms and trials and tribulations come, you can go, hey, God, help me out. God, God, I, I'm, I'm with you. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do this alone. I don't have to do this. It's not by my works, by him. So we're able to operate with him when our trials and tribulations come. So what's awesome is we see in Revelation chapter 21, verses five, and I'm gonna read all the way to eight, and I would stop at seven, but I decided to keep moving because I want you to see what Revelation 21, eight says. But in Revelation 21, five, and the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the alpha and omega, which is so great to hear all of that, that trustworthy and true. He starts with the fact that he is the author of the beginning and the end. He's the alpha and the omega. It's so awesome. The beginning and the end. To all who are what? 
thirsty. There's some action with this. Everyone say thirsty with me. Thirsty. So I want some crowd participation. I never get it. I never ask for it. I just want it every so often. Just make sure you guys are awake. It's really dark in this room right now. I still think some of you are sleeping. No. Okay, good. All right, thanks. To all who are there we go. Thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings and I will be their God and they will be my children. So what? If you are thirsty and you come to him, all right, you'll be what? Victorious. You'll inherit these blessings. You will be, you, you will be a child of God. Why? Because it says, and I will, and he says, I will be their God and they will be my children. And then verse eight, but cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, the murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. You'll see in verse eight that it encompasses those things that are, that are, are wicked, those actions When you start being tempted in trials and tribulations, what happens is those trials and tribulations, if not built on the rock, if not pointing to Jesus, you start getting what? Tempted. Have you ever been to a restaurant? I love going to a restaurant with a new waitress. Oh, new waitresses are the sweetest. They're the best. You walk in, right? And you sit sit down and they have no idea what they're doing. The new waitresses, they're so sweet. They're kind and they always want to apologize for not being quick enough. I always feel, I, I, I always look at my wife and I go, she's new. And, and we're like, oh, she's so sweet. She hasn't been tainted by the world yet. She hasn't been hurt. She hasn't been yelled at. I love when a waitress would look at you and be like, I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm new. I'm like, we know. It's, it's okay. We're totally fine. I love it. I just see the peace that's in them and they're hurrying, they're trying their best and they're, they're very apologetic and they're like, I'm just like, but then you come to a waitress who's been around a little bit, right? Yeah. It's almost to the point when you ask for a new ketchup bottle, they almost want to toss it to you. I can see it in their face, like, just catch it, right? Once you get up, walk, go over there, right? I went to a restaurant in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, it was the, it's called the Pine Club. It's the, the second best steak restaurant in the world, according to the Food Network channel. So I went and I got a, a, a 18 ounce bone-in filet. I didn't pay for it, someone else paid for it. <laughs> so obviously I got the bone-in filet, right? So I'm sitting there and this waitress comes over and she goes, hello. It's just, I'm not kidding, I'm not making this up, right? She's like, what do you guys want? And I'm like, this is the best steak restaurant in the world, like the second best one in the world. And, she, and I go, hey ma'am, how long have you been here? 27 years. I was like, you're like the longest waitress of people. I was like, I've never met someone like you. And she just looked at me like, what do you want? Bone in filet. Okay. And that was it. And she just kept going. My friend asked, she, he goes, hey, can you tell me like more about this place? She goes, it's in the menu. And then she walked away. And I was like, wow, right? Wow. See, when there's trials and temptations, And things happen to you, you get bitter, calloused, hard. You don't want to start, you don't want to meet people. You don't want to talk to people. I went through that a few years ago. I got hurt. And I thought, "Mm -mm, I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to hang out with people. I had people that, I, that would want it. They would call me, but hey, I, I, I want to talk with you. Can you meet me over here? And I'm like, yeah, okay, great. New waitress. And then I walk into the coffee shop and they go, hey, let me tell you all the things that I have a problem with you about what? And they have a list. And they, I don't like how you say this. I don't like when you do that. And I go, whoa. Before you know it, now, now I like when people say, hey, I want to meet with you. I go, mm-mm, mm-mm. I don't want to meet with anybody. I want to hide in a corner. I don't want to talk to nobody because I don't want to, I don't want to be, I don't want to be hurt, right? But then you have to get over that because you got to realize, hey, you know what? It's God's people. They need love. So now when people are like, I don't like this about you. And I go, I just smile and look at him and I go, so God, God's made me unique. Isn't it great that God's made us all unique? Can I come to your house and make a list of all the things I don't like about you? I don't say that. I don't say that. But that's what I'm thinking. I am. But I, I just let it go. I just let it co- fall off my shoulders. And after the meeting, I look at my, I look at my God and I say, God, isn't that, isn't that special? 
God, just, you know, and I rejoice and I praise him. And I say, God, you just take care. God, if there's something in me that needs to change, God, quicken it in my spirit. But God, if there's something that needs to change in them, God, talk to them or forgive me. And I just walk on and then I forget it because you can't harbor these things. You can't. If you harbor them, you start getting bitter. You start getting hurt and you walk around with a lot of pain. And so unfortunately in verse eight, that's what happens when you build your, your foundation on sand. When you build it on sand, you, you start acting as a coward, an unbeliever. You start being corrupt, murderers, murderers in thoughts. Some of you are like, oh, I've never killed anybody. I bet you a lot of people in this room have killed a lot of people in their thoughts. I know it to be true. Immoral. Some of you are like, I don't practice witchcraft. Oh, sure you do. I've seen you pray over your lottery numbers. Some of you are like, no, that's not witchcraft. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Look it up. Look up witchcraft. And you're, you're idol worshipers, you're worshiping those things, your cars. How many of you have polished your cars over the weekend? Extra polished, extra, extra polished, right? Think about these things, guys. These things, if they consume you, if they consume you, then they're, they're idols. So guys, be careful of these things because the more that you put your focus on these items and these, these particular instances in your life, the more it can pull you down, but you've got to rely on him. You've got to trust in him. That's what it's all about. But what's awesome is, is this, the word thirsty. God recognizes there's a thirst in every one of us. There's a thirst. And that thirst can only be quenched by him. And it's for us in those moments, those moments when those thoughts come, those moments when we recognize, oh, okay, come out. My actions are not, are not a representation of, my, of what my true self should be. My actions and my heart don't align. And so I need, to, I need to align my actions with my heart. And my heart should be focused in on him. And when so, when you're thirsty, you can come to him. Jesus didn't say in John chapter seven, Jesus didn't say, hey, all who are, who are thirsty, come and think. He said, come and drink. He didn't say, come and think. A lot of times we, we come to church and we think. I like what he said. I like what the pastor said. That was funny. That made me laugh. And then you leave, and then that's it. He didn't say come and think. He said come and drink. See, here's, tonight, some of you guys are all excited. It's New Year's Eve, and you think, all right, tonight, it's going to be party time. No, party time's on Sundays, because right here's where you learn how to drink. Amen. This is where you learn to drink. You learn to drink here. You get good drinking lessons here. That, that's where it's at. It's here. Because God didn't, Jesus didn't say, come and think. He said, come and drink. There's some action with this. There's some action, some motivation here. I got to tell you, you should be asking yourself, am I drinking with God? Am I drinking with him? Am I, am I taking in what he has for me? Am I drinking this? And so a lot of times you got you to gotta center yourself in with God and you got to say, okay, righteousness. What does righteousness look like? Am I in right standing with him? Am I in right standing with him? Now, there's no other way there's, there's, to say this, and I'm going to work this down and break it down for you guys. There's nothing we can add to our faith to, atter, uh, to obtain right relationship with the Lord. In Romans chapter 11, verse 6, and since it is through God's kindness, then it is not by their good works, for in that case, God's grace would not, it would not be what it really is, free and undeserved. See, it's commonly thought that our actions and, are the determining factor in God's judgment over our righteousness. That's not true. There is a relationship between our actions and our right standing with God. But right relationship with God produces actions. Do you understand that? That a lot of times we think it's, it's by us, our actions. That's why there's so many churches out there that, that create this ritual on Sunday morning that you've got to do things as you walk in to be in right standing with God. It's not that. It's the right standing with him that you're seeking after him, that you're thirsting after him in everything you do. Not just some things, not just on Sunday, but in all things you do, you seek him and then your actions are produced because there's, you're a right standing with him in your heart. That you start seeking after his love 
and his understanding, not your understanding, his understanding. And therefore, we are made righteous by what? His love. Not by what we do, but by his love. So righteousness is a gift. So in Romans chapter five, verse 17 through 18, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone. So this gift of salvation produces a change in our heart and in turn changes our actions. Remember, religion has always told us and has always preached that if we clean up our actions, then our heart will become clean too. But Jesus doesn't preach this. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, it says, what sorrows await you teachers of religious law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, then the outside will become clean too. That's why so many folks who, let's say, let's use this as an example. No one get offended if you're dealing with this, you're going through this right now. I'm not trying to cause condemnation on your life. I'm just using this as an easy example. Some of you who smoke in this room, you're like, I wanna quit. And you should be able to attest to this same example here, that you can do all the outside appearances. Like, all right, I'm not gonna go to this gas station where I always buy my cigarettes. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just stop, cold turkey. And then like a week or two goes by and before you know it, you're right back at it again. You can't break this. But there's gotta be a heart moment inside of you that you finally come to this agreement of like, no, no, no. I gotta come to a realization of a heart issue. Where does, this, where does the cigarettes come from? Like where does, why, what makes me want to go to the cigarette? That's the heart moment. Then, then you say, all right, God, and these heart moments, what makes me run to this? What's this habit? God, I need a heart change. God, I need you. I need you to come and fix inside of my heart. And God starts rearranging and he starts fixing and he starts, he starts getting that habit outside. But that goes with everything. Some of you guys are addicted to shopping. Some of you are addicted to a lot of things that, that you need to have a heart change. Okay, God, what's causing this? addictive behavior? What's causing these things for, that are causing me to, to run and escape from reality? What are those instances? So God, in those heart moments, I want to see an action change. I want to start changing. So Lord, I need you to come into my heart and you got to fix this. And so that's what God's talking about. You got these religious Pharisees who are basically just trying to polish everybody up on the outside, but they're not changing on the inside. That's why so many folks get bitter about church. They get bitter looking at some of us. They do. They look at us and they go, they're a Christian. They're a Christian. Because why? Because your heart produces actions. And it's not a matter of the actions, again, causing salvation. See, people get it mixed up, but it's the heart, out of the heart. So what are we doing? How are we going to change this? Well, it's gonna be it's gonna be actually pretty simple and pretty awesome. So many folks get get caught up in the think, okay, again, Pastor Josh, it seems like you're in this conundrum here. It's it's like it's a catch twenty two. You're, you're mixing it up in my brain. I said, I, I still feel like there's works that have to be done. No, no, there's no works. There's no works involved in this. You're saying, but Josh, you're saying actions. No, I'm saying I'm saying heart. See, what takes place, God comes in. All right, God, this is it. I want you. Everything I do, I'm gonna seek after your face. I'm gonna read your word. I'm gonna do these things. I I want you because I'm going to drink. So the problem with being with the church is that we try to put fences around the sheep. We put fences and say, don't go over here, don't go over here, don't go over here, don't go over here. Well, all we really need to do is point people to the living well. And when we, when, we, when we point to the living well, they don't want to go anywhere else but the living well. So for us, as Christians, we realize, oh, this is much better. When you seek God's face, 
the heart changes and you go, oh, this is way better. This is a way better way to live, way better way to act. See, when people would say offensive things to me, I would want, I would want to run away from the living well and I'd want to go complain to all my friends. Oh, these people have said this to me and these people said this to me and oh, and I wanted to cry about it and whine about it. Now when people say things to me, I just look at God and I go, hey, isn't that funny? And God just, he fixes my actions, my heart. It doesn't weigh on me for hours and hours and hours and days and weeks and months and years because I don't allow it to stick. I don't allow it to stick because the opinions of man don't mean anything. Opinions of man don't mean anything. And do you guys realize how many of you guys would love it? Would just I love it so much if everyone loved you wouldn't that be just awesome? You walk into the room, oh, there he is. There she is. The, the most wonderful person on the planet. Wouldn't you guys just love that? Well, guess what? It's not true. It's not happening. Not everyone loves you. Not everyone thinks you're great. Not everyone thinks you're beautiful, handsome. Not everyone thinks that everything comes out of your mouth is hilarious. Nothing. So that's the truth, and everyone realizes it. Everyone say amen. amen. Ain't nobody like everybody, right? So deal with it. How are you going to deal with it? Him. You're going to walk into work in the next few days, and there's some people who don't like you. But it doesn't mean that because they don't like you that you shouldn't like them. That's the difference. The heart changes when you realize these are God's people, the heart changes. You don't look at them in that same manner anymore because the actions come out of the heart. So in those moments when you say, all right, God, I want to see through your eyes. I want to see through your love. So all of a sudden, when these people come up to you and you know they don't like you, their sin doesn't cause you to sin any longer. All of a sudden, now it changes. You look at them as God's people and you go, you just smile. Even though they do something bad to you, you are able to now go to God and say, hey, God, Hey, I don't, want to, I don't want to feel this way. God, will you, will you correct my heart? And God says, yeah, I'll talk with you. I'll, and God gives you a peace, an understanding. You start seeing people in a different way. You see why they're acting this way. It comes out of James chapter four. The reason why fights and quarrels happens is because of the, the desires of the heart. So when you start seeking God and his desires, it changes. Those actions that come out, changes and you understand righteousness you understand grace it's a free gift you recognize this and you go oh, okay this is not this is not hard it's not by my works i'm not doing anything it's him he's taking care of me that's the wonderful plan of salvation it's that those who put their faith in jesus and what he did for us will get what he deserves on the other hand those who do not put their total faith in christ will ultimately get what they deserve and it's sad and that's why I say a lot of times we get fixated and we think, oh, my bank account's down to $5. God, you're testing me. No, he's looking at you going, no, you're just really bad with money. Why'd you go, to, why'd you go out and buy an 18 ounce filet, bone in filet steak for like 50 bucks? That was stupid. But it was, I was in the moment. I had to do it. You didn't have to do anything. <laughs> I had to. I had to buy that shirt. I had to buy this car. I know I'm touching, touching, some, touching some sensitive nerves this morning. Guys, it happens. It's not trials and temptations from him. It's not seeking after him in these decisions that need to be made. It's saying no to some of the good things to say yes to the better things. In these moments, yeah, it looks good, but God's saying, hey, I've got something better over here. Just wait. I'm positioning this so it all come together. God works it all out. God knows what, what you need. God knows these things. God will work things out for you. But unfortunately, when you start operating outside of his grace and his righteousness, and you start working on your, your own actions of doing things, then you're going to get what, what happens. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to continue to live in this. Now, I will say that. A lot of folks get, 
to this whole thought of it, you just got to work through it. I know that you accepted Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, but now you got a lot of junk in your life that you dealt with, so now you got to keep dealing with it. I got to tell you right now, you ask God for forgiveness, you're forgiven. Amen. You're washed. You don't have to continue to keep working in this. A lot of times we think, well, you know, I made a bad decision. No, now it's, now it's leaning in on God and God will say, okay, now I want you to do this with that decision. Now I want you to do this with that decision. Now I want you to, oh, don't, don't go, don't, don't move. Stay right, right there, right there. Stand still. I'm gonna work something out right now. God will start working something out. God will say, okay, now move, now go. Now I want you to do this. The same goes with Jesus being born. Mary and Joseph they had to go. They had to flee. An angel came and said, hey, bad things are happening. You need to move. Guess what? They moved. They do what God called them to do. There are seasons and times for things, and God is in control of these moments. You've got to let him have control. Otherwise, you are bound to this world. Otherwise, if you don't allow God to be bound to you, you, you are bound to this world. So it may look like you're surrounded, but you're surrounded by God if you let him. And so what are you surrounded by? You're surrounded by God's promises, God's peace, God's protection, and God's power. And Romans chapter 15, verses 12 and 13 says, the heir to David's throne will come and he will rule over the Gentiles. They will place their hope on him. And I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Guys, that, that right there just shakes down everything. I'm all about the shaking down stuff right now because I'm tired. I'm tired of things just weighing on you. I'm gonna shake them off, man. I wanna shake them off. I don't want these things on me. I don't want the thoughts of this world. I don't want the condemnation of this world. I don't want these things to be on me. You shake them off. I don't care. I've heard people say crazy things. You know, our warehouse, right? Gone in there with some subcontractors and they go, oh man, you're in over your head. No, I'm not. I go, oh, what do you, yeah, you are. You're in over your head. That's, this is a big project. And you know, and then the next thing out of his mouth, he's like, you know, I'm an elder at my church. You're a what? You wouldn't be an elder at my church. I'm going to tell you that right now. You're not going to come in and speak doubt. You're not going to come in, man, you're over your head. I'm not an over no head. God's in control of this. What have we been saying for a long time? God created the heavens and the earth without any money. He can take care of an old warehouse. And by the way, I ain't in over my head. This some contractor's crazy. We're not in over our head. That's ridiculous. God knows what's happening. God told us, go, go forward, move forward. Okay. And we move forward. And what, he, what has he done? He has provided. He provides those who are faithful and move forward. So when I hear these doubt and unbelief, I look at him, I go, what? shut up. I don't want to hear that. You get up and move away. Walk away. Start hearing things. Walk away. Nonsense, man. Nonsense. I heard all kinds of nonsense things at Christmas time family members just talking, talking all this crazy stuff. I got up and walked away. Why? Because I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear these things. I know what the word of God says. I know what his promises speak to me. I know what surrounds me. Why would I sit and let things that are not of God surround me? Mm -mm, I don't want that. See you later. I get up and I move. I don't want to be a part of that. Gossip, doubt, unbelief, bitterness, strife, anger, I heard these stories, well, yeah, you don't know what this guy did to me, let me tell you. I'm like, see you later. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear these things. I want to hear what God's doing. What did God do? No one can ever tell me that half the time. I'm always kind of waiting. What did God do? I go, well, God's good. <laughs> it's like the, the easiest Christian cop-out statement. God's good. <laughs> Great. <laughs> like, we know this. But what is God doing? What have you going to him? Because that's the true testament. What is God speaking to you? Some of you need to ask that question. That's why I ask, what are you doing in the battles? Are you trusting or you're doubting? So the question, another question to ask yourself is, what's God speaking to you? If you say, he doesn't say anything to me, he's quiet. You're not talking to him then. My God talks. My God talks a lot. Why? Because I've got a lot of decisions. 
Every time I wake up in the morning, I make a decision. I wake up, get out of bed. God's, I'm making decisions. God, what do you have? What do you want me to do? Get up. Okay, I'm up. What do you want me to do now? Don't eat those pancakes. They'll make you fat. All right. Thank you, God. I look at the pancakes. I go, no pancakes. But then you put blueberries in them, and then I'm a sucker. I go right for the pancakes. Oh, God, why not eat the pancakes? I told you not to eat those pancakes. You think I'm crazy. I'm talking about the small things. God, carbs feel so good. Carbs are so fun. And then 20 minutes later, what happens? And you're like, oh, why'd I eat that? Why'd I, why'd I do that? My son last night, right? My son, my, middle, my, my second son, Cohen, he comes, he comes, uh, he comes into the, he, we put him to bed and he comes out and he comes in the living room and he goes, I don't feel good. And I go, well, why? He goes, I don't feel good. He goes, I think it was the pie I just ate. I said, pie? So we made pie last night. So I gave him a piece of pie with ice cream. So I gave him that, right? And then he said, and then I got thirsty and I drank lemonade. You drank lemonade after you ate pie with ice cream? Well, no wonder you're sick. Well, I didn't know. My son hasn't heard, he hasn't learned to hear from God yet. I'm like, son, those don't mix. He said, well, I tried to cover it up with water afterwards. I said, you drank water on top of the lemonade and the pie and the ice cream? You need to go barf, son. No wonder you don't feel good. What do I need to do? That's what's great about the age accountability. The parents are in charge. So now I'm like, I got to watch their intake, what they're doing. Guys, we got to be careful in everything that we do, every thought, everything that comes through. We need to align it with the word of God. Does the word of God flow from you? Because those who place their hope on him, all right, the source of hope, they will, what, completely be filled with joy and peace. Nothing in this word here tells me that when I do this, that God will then test me with hurt and pain and suffering. No, he says that there will be hurt, pain, and suffering. But guess what? But we can come to him in those trials and tribulations so we can overcome those things. That we can, that we can be victorious in those things. I mean, David talks about it in Psalm 125. He says, those who trust in the Lord are as secure as Mount Zion. They will not be defeated, but will endure forever just as the mountains surround Jerusalem. So the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. The wicked will not rule the land of the godly for then the godly might be tempted to do wrong. Oh Lord, do good to those who are good. Hmm, that's not what I've heard back in the day when I sat in those hard pews back in the day. Oh, I'm touching somebody, come on. Oh Lord, do good to those who are good, whose hearts are in tune with you. But banish those who turn to crooked ways, O Lord. Take them away with those who do evil. May Israel have peace. You guys got to recognize that on the chessboard of God, the devil has no more moves. He's in constant checkmate. He has no more moves. So for us, we need to recognize that we operate with a Savior, that now we are in right standing with God that we can go to him, that we don't have to do sacrifices. We don't have to go through a high priest. Jesus is our high priest. He is our high priest. In Hebrews, you learn all about it. He is our high priest. So therefore, we have the promises given to Abraham, promises to Elijah, promises to, to Noah. All these promises are our promises. And now we can operate in hope and faith and understand that when we lean in on God, and we trust in on him that all of our surroundings, all of our issues will be taken care of. That we don't have to say, oh, but, but should, I, oh, should I? No, God will tell you, don't do this. And you'll know. Trust me, you'll know. I've been in those moments. I've been in those moments where ooh, God quickens you. And you go, oh, no, no, I'm not doing that. I don't want to do that. And you just know you're not supposed to. It just happens. It's just, I'm not doing it. We're going to talk about it in February. We're going to talk about the will of God in February. We're going to talk about healing in the next few weeks in January. We're going to talk about healing, God's will to heal. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to go into God's will. But 
I want us to re, I want us to start operating with the trusting in him. That salvation is trusting in him. So in everything you do, there's trust. Everything you do, there is hope in him. So you're not sitting around going, I just don't know what I should do. No, if you don't know what you should do, then you're not talking to God. And I wouldn't move any further until you heard from him. That's a safe bet right now. But don't get complacent because God wants you to move. He's an action God. God gives you action. There's faith and works. Your works produce faith because you are moving in the right direction with him. And so therefore, when things happen, when trials and tribulations come, when those storms come, your faith abounds. And in James chapter one, if you need wisdom, asking. If you need anything, you lack in anything, asking. That's what God is all about. God's sitting here in the conflict and he's giving you the resolution. It's just a matter of you saying, I wanna hear what his resolution is and I wanna abide by it. I wanna do it. And that's what he's talking about, David. He's talking about you just choose. You choose in this moment to follow him. You choose to trust in him. Well, you're, you're secure. You're secure. So you don't walk around with fear and trembling. Oh, so many of us walk around with fear. Oh, oh, did you guys hear about that thing over there? Did you hear about that? I heard it all over Christmas. The whole time I was around family. Did you, did you hear about what happened? It's a matter of time. Heard gas prices, they can... They could break any moment right now. I, I think I made it through the $4 and some gallon a few years ago. I made it. Did you guys make it? I think you did. You did. Good job. I've heard it. I've heard gas prices. Oh, stock market's up high right now. At any moment, it could crash. Oh. You see, there's not a bit of worry on my face. I don't really care. <laughs> and it's genuine. I really don't. Because why? My God's good. Everyone, let's build a bunker. Zombie apocalypse at any moment. It's been like, what, nine seasons of the zombie show? Nine seasons, still no zombies. Still no zombies. Right? Nothing. People are like, Josh, you need to get a gun. You need to get a gun. People don't realize there's a difference between hillbillies and rednecks. I've learned it. West Virginia has hillbillies. And North Carolina has rednecks. No offense, North Carolinians. I'm a North Carolinian now, okay? I don't like West Virginia anymore. I like, I want to be here, okay? <laughs> however, however, I've learned that the rednecks live in North Carolina. Rednecks, you have a hundred guns and you want to show everybody all your guns. In West Virginia, hillbillies only have one gun. They use that for protection and hunting. That's it. And it's usually a rifle or a shotgun and that's it. 30 six, something, right? Well, this guy, guess what? how many guns I own? One. It's, a one. it's a rifle. It's an old cowboy. Winchester, right? Old school. It sits underneath my bed. I'm ready. When a rabbit pops up in my yard, I'll shoot it. <laughs> People, years ago, Josh, you need to get a gun. Mm, no. You need to get a gun. That doesn't mean I won't. doesn't mean that I won't. I know some of you are like, oh, you need it. You need it. Pastor Josh, zombie apocalypse. You never know, the world's a pressure cooker. I, is it? I, I, I work out at a gym, at Gold's Gym. And there's three televisions where I work out at. I have ESPN in the middle. I have Fox News and I have CNN. It's right here. So it's really funny. Because depending upon where I position myself at the weights, okay, so if I position myself here, I'm looking at CNN, and I see, I see Trump does something stupid, basically, and administration, awful. I turn over here, and I look at this television screen, and at Fox, and I see uh, Trump is awesome, uh, highest ratings, whatever, and then I see some fluff piece about some kid and, and some awesome thing. Over here's death and destruction because they are a Democratic television show, and then here's a Republican Fox thing, and it's, it's, it's just it's where you want to gaze, where you want to look. Because I remember back in the Obama administration, Obama's awful, Obama's bad, it's all these bad things, and then over here, it's like best best economics, whatever, since blah, 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 since 
whatever. Obama is awesome. And then I look over here at ESPN and now they don't, do, they don't actually do sports anymore. Now it's politics. Such and such raped someone, sexual harassment, all these things. They won't, they won't stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. They won't do these things. I'm watching all this. And so then I'm like, man, thank God I can't hear any of this. Because in my head, I got Hillsong. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God's so good, guys. And we get our fix on all these crazy things. And you start feeling depressed. You start feeling the weights and foundation being sh shaken. Not me. So my, my encouragement to you this morning is what are you surrounded by? Are you surrounded by trust? Let's pray.